Sardak Pati from the University of Pennsylvania. Can you share your slides? So you will be presenting uh, reproducible open source solutions for AI and clinical workflows. We're still muted. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much, organizers and uh, and the moderator for inviting me for this talk. Uh, I don't have any conflicts to disclose. So <clears throat> my name is Sarthak Pati. I'm a researcher and a software developer at the Center for Biomedical Image Computing and Analytics at the University of Pennsylvania. Our center works very closely with clinicians to solve problems in medicine using computational tools. Um, and the topic for today uh, is going to be reproducible open source solutions for AI in clinical workflows. Uh, so let me first start by discussing some of the common terminology used when discussing about software, starting with uh, open and closed source. So the major difference between uh, both of them is that the open source software allows modification of any part of the code base and their maintenance is based on the active participation of the scientific community. Um, so anytime we develop any kind of computational tool, we keep the FAIR criteria in mind all the time. So FAIR means the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Uh, and this is uh, the ethos around which our entire development uh, uh, is focused. So recently, the value of imaging has been appreciated in identifying uh, sub-visual patterns for personalized medicine, prediction of clinical outcomes, as well as finding associations with molecular characterizations. And all of these have been published in very high-impact journals. Modern imaging, modern medical imaging is extremely complex as evidenced by the following scans that are routinely acquired for any suspected brain tumor patient in our university hospital. Uh, the structural sequences define the anatomical characteristics of the subject and the diffusion tensor and the dynamic susceptibility contrast images try to provide an outline of the physiological characteristics. Now, uh, here I would like to uh, try and encapsulate the paradigm of computational analysis that the field is following, where various low-level tasks describing more basic computational questions such as image registration uh, for in-tandem analysis for multi-parametric data, uh, tumor segmentation, quantitative feature extraction, biophysical growth modeling, or even creation of parametric maps to describe spatial patterns. All of these produce high throughput medical imaging data, which integrated via machine learning can be used to answer more clinically relevant questions, such as prediction of patient survival and tumor recurrence, as well as prediction of molecular characteristics and even unsupervised data-driven subtyping of diseases. Um, let's start by uh, putting some more details on some of the terminologies which we just heard, um, starting with radiomics, which defines the features extracted from radiographic imaging. They allow for quantitative analysis. Radiogenomics, on the other hand, defines correlations between these radiomic features and genomic or molecular data. This can be used. Uh, this can be used because single biopsy simply cannot capture the full heterogeneity, and not all tumors can be biopsied or resected. The question that we have been trying to answer is that: a, Can tumor characteristics be manifested by distinct imaging patterns or not? For example, can we determine molecular mutations by looking at the location of the tumor? We, in fact, can, and we have shown it in multiple publications. Similarly, can we label peritumoral tissue in preoperative images as most likely to present recurrence? We, once again, can. This work is currently undergoing a clinical trial at the University Hospital um, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, and uh, it is using our open source tools. Uh, we would like to profusely thank uh, NCI and ITCR for their continued support to develop informatics tools and their stress on open source development. Now let's uh, touch upon some of the uh, different sources of variation when we do medical image analysis. We start with variations that one can see while calculating these radiomic features. And then we look at some of the imaging characteristics that can affect computational analysis. Um, starting with uh, the feature extraction. 
So quantization of any image histogram can be done by either dividing the intensity range into equally sized bins or by fitting an, uh, a distribution to all of the intensities. Calculation of features also deal with different neighborhoods around the central pixel. And uh, for, for this particular illustration, let's take a look at the gray level co-occurrence matrix as an example. The neighborhood can be defined as a 2D only as a forward pass, both 2D and 3D in the forward pass, and both 2D and 3D by looking at the entire region around the center pixel. Finally, features can be calculated from each offset and then averaged or by aggregating all of the matrices into a single one and then calculating a single set of features. The community has put forth the image by market standardization initiative to define all of these differences across multiple feature families in a very nice and mathematical way. And I strongly recommend that for some detailed reading. Next up are the imaging properties. So let's start with image resolution. This is essentially the size of an individual pixel and it's usually highly correlated with image clarity. Another major source of variation is the type of coordinate system considered during computation. The image co coordinate system is the one where the first pixel of any image is the, uh, is the actual image is, and that's considered as the origin. And when we consider the scanner as the origin, it's the world coordinate system. To illustrate uh, one such variation, let's start with a simple example. We have an imaging protocol that consists of a low resolution scanner, which scans in 10 millimeter intervals. Using a very simple 1D data, which, which has a total length of 10 mm, we see that this particular scanner outputs an image of one pixel. Now, when we look at a second protocol, which consists of a high resolution scanner that scans at every one mm interval, the same data is scanned to an image of 10 pixels. Right here, we start seeing the differences. So assuming that the original image intensities are between zero and 255, a 10-bit quantization of the histogram yields a single pixel for the first protocol and 10 pixels for the second. When we start constructing a feature matrix around those numbers, we see a clear difference between protocols one and two. And if we train a machine learning model with this, this will result in these feature vectors being categorized as two completely separate images, which is clearly not correct. And the results of the, this, and these kinds of erroneous results can uh, hamper clinical translation significantly. Um, for more detailed reading, I, I strongly recommend some excellent resources from the Insight Toolkit team. Um, and, and I can share these links separately as well. Um, all of the tools that, that have been developed at our center have been, uh, have been done by keeping these sources of variation in mind. Uh, starting with the Cancer Imaging Phenomics Toolkit, or CAPTK, which is a multi-PI effort to develop a deployable tool that is easy to use and extendable. It is truly cross-platform, open source, and it is accessible via the web. Basically, by using CAPTK, you can do pre-processing to segmentation, radiomic feature extraction, and train a traditional machine learning model. So all computational analysis steps, apart from interaction with the packs, can be done via CAPTK. Now that we have covered our tool leverage in traditional machine learning, let's move on to something that does deep learning. We were looking for a deep learning framework that could be used to generate baseline results very quickly support multiple network architectures, tackle various AI workloads such as segmentation, regression, classification, handle multiple inputs and outputs, has robust data augmentation because as we all know, medical data is fairly scarce, uh, can be easily deployed in the clinic and ensure continuity of academic and clinical research because usually there is a lot of churn in this environment. And most importantly, it is open source. All of this has led us to the development of the generally nuanced deep learning framework or Gandalf. And it has a focus on ease across two very important fronts for users to quickly generate baseline results to ensure that they have some signal in the data. And this can be done purely using text-based configuration with, with zero coding and for users to apply their methods into a vast array of workloads and data sets. So for example, if you design a new optimizer, you can simply plug it into Gandalf and it can work across multiple AI workloads. 
Obviously, since Gandalf is based on well-known open source tools, it is extremely modular and versatile. And this is the overall clinical workflow uh, of Gandalf, clinical and computational actually. So clinically oriented researchers can only focus on the red block, as you see, which is completely text-based and uh, customizable. Whereas computationally oriented researchers can work on adding their pipeline, uh, on adding their portion, uh, their method in any portion of the, uh, of the rest of the pipeline. And as you can see, it's very clean and it just works. Now let's move on to a tool that applies the concept of deep learning to solve a real world problem. Data from a single institution is usually used to train a machine learning model. However, the problem is that the performance is severely limited by the data set size, which affects its uh, accuracy and the diversity in the data, which affects its generalizability. Data from a single institution can simply not fix all of these issues. To solve this, we need to look at international and multi-institutional collaborations that can provide large data sets beyond what a single institution can feasibly hold. For multi-site collaborations, the current paradigm is to centrally share the data and then train a machine learning model. This simply cannot be scaled because of multiple regulatory, confidentiality, and cultural concerns. Working in close collaboration with Intel, we are proposing an alternative paradigm for multi-institutional collaborations, leveraging the concept of federated learning, where data actually rests with individual institutions and each site trains their own machine learning model. An aggregator collects all of these models. And let me note here, these are only the machine learning models, no data is shared and this, collects all of these models and converts them into a consensus model and then passes it back to data owners. The consensus model basically has knowledge gained from all collaborating institutions without any data sharing, thereby unlocking data silos. Collaborators from all over the world will enable models for the Federated Tumor Segmentation or FETS initiative to gain knowledge from what seems to be one of the most largest and most diverse patient population data sets. This aims to collaboratively solve various clinical problems while preserving data silos. To bring back the context uh, to reproducible and open source solutions in AI in, work, uh, in clinical workflows, to ensure robust computational analysis, we need to be aware of the metadata of medical images, such as coordinate systems, resolution, uh, be aware of the definitions of the computational paradigms and algorithms, leverage easy to use tools and open source tools to design robust pipelines without actually needing to reinvent the wheel. And finally, providing feedback to the open, to the open source developers and community to further facilitate open science. With this, I would like to give my thanks and uh, open it up for questions. All right, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so if people have questions, please enter them either in the live chat or in the Q and A uh, box. Um, maybe in the meantime, I can ask a question. So you showed this diagram where uh, individual institutes have their own data and they design a uh, or they, they develop a network, and the network goes to a consensus system. Computer that then generates, or, or computer that generates this consensus network. But is there a continuing feedback loop there, or is this like a one turn path that you can do? Yes, so it can be defined in multiple ways. So either, uh, so the way we have seen that works best is that we do either half an epoch or one epoch in individual institutions, send the model updates. So the gradient, the gradients of the model are very small, send that to the aggregator, the aggregator combines them, sends the updated model back, and then using the new model, the individual uh, institutions continue the training and this feedback loop goes on till the model converges. All right, that's an interesting concept, but if you have um, uh, different institutes, some may have very small data sets, other ones may have very large data sets, some may be more uh, diverse than others. Is there a way of reweighting uh, contributions from different institutes or is it just like every institute is one and over the number of institutes available that contributes to the network? 
That, that's a great question. So uh, the the simplest way to solve this is by doing weighted averaging. So uh, our tools also include harmonized pre-processing. So regardless of, let's say, the, the scanner resolution or the input type, we make sure that everything is uh, all the images are registered to a common anatomical atlas. So thereby we are ensuring um, spatial, uh, uh, spatial, harmon uh, spatial harmonization. And um, in terms of the model updates, all of the model updates are weighted according to the, the number of data sets that an institution has. So this way, a site that let's say has 500 um, uh, institutions is weighted differently from a site that has let's say only 50. I, I, yeah, Koji. Uh, may I? Uh, so, uh, using your further uh, learning framework, I well, uh, I want to try how much my uh, model performs without using other institutes' uh, data as a training data. I mean, for external validation, can I use my model? How good will my yeah? Uh, yeah. It's, it's so. So even that can be uh, defined by the uh, experiment uh, by, you know, let's say if you're the experiment owner, you can define it and you can choose to keep, let's say 10% of your data uh, hidden from the entire training set. So this way the training mechanism actually doesn't see that much data. And then at the end of each iteration, that 10% or the 20%, how much of our data you, you decide to keep as holdout, uh, you generate validation metrics along with that. So even if you don't want to join a federated network, uh, the FETS tool or the, so the FETS tool has Gandalf underneath it. So you it you can use the FETS tool or the Gandalf tool to do, to, to do training on only on your data without actually having to join a network. Uh, and one more question. Uh, when, when we want to do the federated learning, we, uh, the, the institute uh, who's going to attend needs some sort of consensus to use that model. How do you achieve that process? Uh, you mean on the model architecture or the actual yeah. model consensus? Yeah. Uh, so uh, for so the model yeah. architecture, so for hmm. the model architecture, we usually go with the current state of the art. So, for example, in uh, in our use case that we um, that we recently concluded, uh, we used a very standard off-the-shelf uh, 3D unit with residual connections. So nothing, you know, you know, like super fancy in terms of you know cascaded models or aggregated models. So very simple. But I mean, you you'll see the paper coming out fairly fairly soon. But it performs fairly comparably to to the current state of the art. So maybe for my naive, uh, that does it mean that all the institutes need to have the same network topology, the same number of layers, and yes. uh, the same hierarchy? Yeah. Yes. So is there, I guess the alternative strategy would be that each university or each institution trains its own network and then shares their networks with each other and compares them and, and uh, for so, so I'm, I'm trying to see like what's the difference. Do you need that that centralized computer to combine uh, the findings, or could you share between institutes directly the trained uh, networks? Absolutely. So the mechanism that I described is uh, what is naively called federated averaging. So the other way to do it is uh, using, and that, and this is a star topology where the central node is the aggregator and that combines everything. The reason why we picked this is because all of the institutions have uh, have some kind of agreement or some kind of collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. So they trusted University of Pennsylvania to maintain security, to maintain InfoSec uh, protocols. And we went through a lot of hassle to make sure that all of the InfoSec was taken care of. And that's actually one of the reasons why we couldn't use Docker containers because no InfoSec personnel in any hospital in any country <laughs> agreed so we we had to um, do a native solution for for this entire tool um, yeah so that's actually one of the reasons why but the fetch tool allows you to do what is called a swarm learning so where each uh, participating node can act both as a collaborator and as an aggregator as well so that's that's what is called swarm learning in federated learning